Yeah, what I'm guessing that you can see me now. Hello, great to have you on board, by the way. Um, I'm in uh, Joyrider TV Studio uh, 2. Uh, I was just trying to use the GoPro to get a higher quality of video, which I believe is has been proven now to be dangerous because uh, in the test it did work, but here live it's not working uh, at all. So anyway, going back to the live chat. Hello, thanks for tuning in, by the way. Uh, yeah, so yeah, back to what Chris is doing in Texas. He's organising the 50th anniversary um, and he's trying to get 50 boats uh, to attend the event to mark the 50th anniversary um, there in Texas, which will be in June next year. So if you are a Prindle sailor, you want to get over there. If you're not a Prindle sailor, but you think this sounds like a great idea, then what you could consider is um, earlier on this week, I put out a video which was some boats for sale. One of them happened to be a Prindle 18. Uh, the boats that were for sale are in Florida. You could get, you could buy this Prindle 18 off Bill. I think he only wanted to go to the event. And then if all that you were buying it for was the event, I'm sure that there'd be someone there who would buy it from you because uh, Prindles aren't as, um, what would you, uh, what's the word? <laughs> They're not as readily available as Hobie 16s, for example. So they are a bit more of a rarity. So if you do see a Prindle for sale, well worth having a sniff and getting to that event. There you go. All right, we've got Antoni from Hong Kong. Hi, great to have you on board. Uh, who else is here? We've got William. Hi, good morning. And we've got Nick. Hi, Nick. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And we've got, of course, Dave. Office hands, Dave, because uh, uh, danger never takes a day off as well we know. Yes, that's right. I am in Joyrider TV Studio 2 this afternoon. Very exciting. I have moved location uh, for the winter now. So this is where I'm going to be for the winter. Um, and eventually what I'll try to do is kind of like what we were doing last winter where I had a 16 outside and we could do the Q&A from outdoors and take a look at bits of the boat when it was necessary. All right, hi Ben. Uh, what do you know? Uh, not as much as you might expect, but more than you might think. Um, all right, just scrolling through. Um, Rodrigo from Brazil. Hi Rodrigo. Uh, Rodrigo was featured earlier on in this week. He put a video on Facebook of absolutely sending it on his 16. I think he hit uh, 22 knots, which is really cooking the goose, as anybody who has done 22 knots will tell you. So um, it is worth joining the, um, what's it called, Hobie Sailors group on Facebook, because there's a, a lot of the Joyrider TV community are also the Facebook group community as well. A lot of questions answered in a lot shorter time than I seem to be taking these days. So uh, well worth a look. Right. Still more comments on the, on the bad presentation. Uh, more downhaul needed to get the video going. Uh, Roger says it must be that Greek high-speed internet. Certainly is. All right, nice birth control glasses. <laughs> very good. Ah, Roger's from Kansas City. Very good. Um, I've been told also this week that next year, also in June, there's going to be, um, I think, one of the first tornado events that there's been for quite some time, and that's going to be in Kansas. So uh, if you're a tornado sailor in the US, there's something exciting going on. All right, now I believe I've actually got a question from Albert. Hello, Albert. Thanks for tuning in. He says, may you explain what you did to pitch pole deliberately to know how to avoid it? Okay, that's a great question. So the deliberate pitch pole, how to perform this manoeuvre. Um, 
is basically if you sail on um, pretty much any point of sail actually, so anything from upwind all the way down to a broad reach, if and it, you'll need a fair amount of wind, you can get the nose to dig in in probably as little as six knots of wind, but it does take a bit more technique. But to get the nose of the boat to dig in, what you need to do is bear away quite aggressively, so turn away from the wind, and at the same time, if it's not so windy, at the same time sheet in, or if it is quite windy, at the same time, don't sheet out. So, in answer to your how to avoid the pitch pole, if you ever bear away from the wind, so on the board here, we've always got the wind coming from the top. So if we're sailing in this direction, and we turn this way, away from the wind, if, oh, we're not quite on the screen there, and we've got some glare. All right, let's see if we can move the glare. All sorts of experimentation going on in the studio now that the season's finished. Um, <laughs> all right, back, uh, still a little way to go. Yeah, so if you turn this way without letting the main sheet out, then what that is gonna do is force the bows of the boat under the water, which is likely to get you to pitch pole. Of course, different types of boat, boats pitch pole more readily than others. So something with a lot of volume in the front, like, um, like an F-18, for example, is likely to dive, but maybe not flip, Whereas something without so much volume in the front, like a Hobie 14, that is gonna buck you off um, very quickly. So the golden rule is whenever you bear away, if it's windy, you should sheet out. Um, and just, if you wanna be quite refined about your sheeting out, just sheet out and use the main sheet against the bow, the leeward bow. So look at the leeward bow as you're sheeting out and you can see whether it's going down, uh, whether it's coming up, that might mean that you've eased too much, or if it's staying the same, which is what you want to do. It go, it lifting is of course better than it diving because it lifting just means you're gonna be going a little bit slower, whereas it diving means that you are likely to be going for a swim shortly. So there you go, that would be my biggest tip on avoiding the pitch pole. The other thing you can do is of course your crew position on the boat. So um, if we take an aerial view of the boat, if we're sailing, just for ease of drawing's sake, we're sailing solo. And if we're trapezing here and the bow's getting close to going under, this may seem quite obvious, but just move towards the back of the boat and then you'll be levering that bow up, making it less likely for you to stick the nose in. There we go. That is how not to pitch pole. It's, it is easier than you think not to pitch pole in up to around 25 knots of wind. And then when the wind gets that strong, Sometimes, when you're trying to go downwind, it's just not actually possible to avoid it. So there you go, hope that helps, Albert. Let's keep those bows dry, kind of. All right, so, David, hi, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, David says, I just got a Spitfire. If you're not familiar with the Spitfire, the Spitfire is kind of like, um, it's kind of like an F-16, but it was built before the F-16s came out as a class. So it doesn't quite fit in with the 16 foot um, rule of, it's 16 feet long, two meters 60 wide. So very powerful boat, um, very quick, feels great, but it doesn't quite qualify as an F-16. Um, 
setting it up for an all up crew weight of 175 in order to achieve the 38 mil of pre-bend on the diamond wires, uh, on the mast, sorry, the diamond wires are drum tight. Is this okay? Now, what I would say with the diamond wires is it will be very useful to, um, I, I'd say to borrow a loose gauge. Have I got a loose gauge handy? No, I'm afraid not, um, not in the workshop. Um, but what a loose gauge is, it's the industry standard rig tension gauge for sailing boats. And that will tell you how much um, tension you've got in your various bits of wire on the boat. So we'd use the loose gauge for setting the diamond wires and for setting the rig tension. Um, on a boat like a Spitfire, you want to have, um, all right, let's just talk a little bit about pre-bend. So the pre-bend on the boat, if this is the mast, what on earth is pre-bend? Hmm. Um, what we've got on the mast of the slightly more modern boat is you've got these things here, about halfway, not quite halfway up the mast. These are called spreaders. And then a little bit lower down from where the rigging comes from, you've got these wires that go to the ends of the spreaders and down to the base of the mast. These are called diamond wires because they form the shape of a diamond, not because um, they are made of diamond. They would be frightfully expensive. Now, um, what happens if we look side on with the mast? The spreaders, we're going a little bit 3D here. The spreaders will be coming back slightly like this and then the diamond wires will be going like this. So when we put tension on the diamond wires, that pushes this part of the mast forwards, which gives us pre-bend. Um, so what we're adjusting here with the diamond wires and the spreaders is the pre-bend in the mast, but also how stiff this section of the mast is. So what we will do to set the pre-bend in the mast is firstly, we need to adjust the spreaders to see, um, and the spreaders, the angle of the spreaders should be set according to your crew weight. So um, with an F-18, which will be sort of similar to that of the Spitfire, I believe it's about um, five centimetres, five centimetres, how on earth do you measure that? Well, let's draw another picture. So if we've got the mast here, there'll be a spreader either side, this is not to scale. Then what we would do is we'd put a stick or a straight line, something like a baton between the tips of the spreaders and then we'd measure between the back edge of the mast and that straight line, and that is what your spreader deflection or spreader rake will be. So um, the distance there between that straight line and the back of the mast wants to be about six centimetres. But what you could do, every type of boat should have on the internet a rig tuning guide where it will actually tell you definitively what the numbers are for the different weights for uh, spreader rake and for your diamond wire tension. So that's the spreader rake set there. And then what we're looking to do with the diamond wire tension is we um, adjust the diamond wire tension according to wind strength. So for I'll tell you the tornado numbers because that's obviously what I've been doing most recently. So in the light winds, we're using the loose gauge to get these numbers. Um, in light winds, we'd have it at 36. And then as the wind increases, 
we tighten these wires up and then in really strong winds, we'd want to have it at 41. So that's our range five on the loose gauge. Now, what is this pre-bend doing? Well, as it sounds, it is bending the mast. And by bending the mast, what that means is it becomes easier to get the downhaul on because as we're pulling the downhaul on, the downhaul is actually trying to bend the mast. So the more that we've got the mast bent already, the easier it is to bend it more. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, so if we've got the mast set very straight and very stiff, it's very difficult to get the mast to bend, which means when you pull the downhaul on, you get the maximum amount of curvature in the sail, which is going to give you more power. We, when we pull the downhaul on, the mast bends more. It means it's a lot easier to flatten the sail. So um, the diamond wires, back to David's original question, um, should they be drum tight? Yes, they will feel tight. But what I would do is borrow a loose gauge. And then what you can do, because you don't want to have to borrow a loose gauge every time you want to adjust your diamond wires, then um, what you can do is, is make some sort of calibration marks um, at the base of your mast. So if, you've, if this is a close-up of the bottom of your mast, perhaps you've got a bottle screw here where you adjust your diamond wires and then they go out like that. Um, perhaps all you need to do is find something convenient uh, down here, um, like perhaps there's a join there, and you can measure where, let's say 36 is your light wind setting. So put a mark on the mast where the light wind setting is, 36, and then put a mark on the mast where the strong wind setting is, and then you know that's what your range is. So if you've got a moderate wind, or you just want to set it for all conditions, then park it in the middle. If it's going to be really windy, max it out. If, it's going to, if you're racing and it's not going to be so windy, then put it at the minimum. There we go. But once again, I'd say check the Class Association website to get the definitive numbers for that. All right. So, um, okay, continuing. Uh, Craig, Chris says, Benjamin says hi. He'll be racing in the North Americans on Hi Joel. Hi, Hi Joel. Nice, excellent stuff. Benjamin is um, one of the youngest Hobie sailor, uh, cat sailors, sorry, uh, in the world. I think he's only about 10. So great stuff there. All right, Sebu. Hi, my best sailing coach, Joe. Insurance asks me how much are the sales on a Hobie 16? A suit of sales new at retail price would cost something like, I'd say, being conservative, something like 2,000 euros something along those lines. Main and jib. Yeah, about 2,000 euros. It shouldn't be less than that. It sh shouldn't be more than that anyway. All right, seems like the chat has dried up. I'm guessing that something is wrong with the stream. Okay, I'm going to carry on regardless and hopefully everybody's going to come back and or everybody's still here. Aha. Uh -huh. All right, Piz7, hi Joe, great footage over the world. Thanks very much, glad you enjoyed that. It, even though the event was a bit disappointing because we didn't do so well, it was still um, a great event. Um, even just having 17 boats there, with tornadoes, because they're big boats, relatively, it is really nice when you get that many boats on the start line. It does feel like you really are a part of something special there. 
So uh, definitely a good time and definitely a learning experience with um, light wind sailing. So that was an absolute Bobby Dazzler to go and be a part of that. All right, what I'm feeling for the future of the Joyrider TV live streams is I won't try being too fancy because I'm not sure if my high speed Greek internet is coping with what I'm doing right now. But anyway, hi David, thanks for tuning in. Great to have you on board. Anyway, um, I've got some preloaded questions, so I thought I might just shoot off with the first. And this one's from Jamie, um, who asks, what do you use to record your speed? Well, funny you should ask. All right, let's, uh, uh, what? Nope. Yeah, so um, what I use to record my speed generally is, this is a Locosys GW60. Um, the reason that I opted for this one is because it is the official uh, GPS of the Windsurfing Speed Sailing Association. It does seem a little bit that the windsurfers are a little bit more organised when it comes to the speed sailing than us cat sailors are, which is also why I set up the global speed stick, because it seemed like there wasn't anything else out there for cat sailors. Now, the great thing with this one, I'm just trying to find the sweet spot. Obviously, I can't get a signal just here because of being indoors, but maybe... Yeah, so what you get on the GW60, if you can see that there, is it does your stats as well as your top speed. So you can see in that previous session, although the top speed was 18.93, over 100 metres it was 18.19, and over 500 metres, 16.55. Now, the good thing about having those sort of stats is it means you can double check your, your top speeds. Because if you go out sailing and you put in a speed of something like, let's say, 25 knots, and granted, you might have felt that you were going quite fast, but maybe you weren't double trapezing, maybe um, you just want to double check that that 25 knots is genuine, then you can look at the speed over the distance, and if it says top speed 25 knots, and then it says top speed for two seconds, 18 knots, then that 25 knots is probably some sort of GPS satellite spike thing where it's moving, I think what happens is the signal moves from one satellite to another satellite, and it might actually make you feel, make it read slower or faster than you actually went. So um, for that reason, getting these average speeds adds a bit of um, accuracy and gives you a bit more confidence that what you've done is actually what you've done. It's GW60. Um, also, of course, with all of the GoPros, this is uh, the GoPro Hero 8, uh, black. Um, all of the GoPros since the GoPro Hero 5, um, they all have an inbuilt GPS, which means, no, you can't see it at the time when you're sailing, but afterwards, if you use a piece of software, you can use the GoPro Quick app on your telephone, or this actually leads quite nicely in, you're not going to believe it, to the next question, um, which is from uh, Mickey, Mickey Madrid. Hello, Mickey. Who says, thanks for all your videos, I learn a lot. How do you show the speed and the map? Is there only a GoPro or do you have another thing? Yes, so in the videos, this if you've seen any of the recent videos, um, 
Let, I'm actually, I'm giving up trying to be flash with the, uh, the actual video that I'm showing. Uh, I've still got a long way to go with live stream technology. Okay, so in the more recent videos I've been doing, if this is, there's the screen, there's some bloke on a catamaran, um, I don't even know what I'm trying to draw here. Um, hand in the air. All right, so, so on the video screen, what I'm doing at the moment with the, well, the more recent videos is in this corner, we'll have a speedo, which is obviously showing us how fast we're currently going. Very nice. Then what we can also add is a speed chart which shows you when the biggest speeds are coming or what the speed was throughout that session. And then what we can also add, and this is really nice, um, I usually put it in this corner for some reason, is we can put, we can have a map of where we were sailing and then a speed, like a chart of our route. Um, and all of this, Basically, you, you used to be able to add the speedo and the speed graph using the GoPro Quick app on the desktop computer, but now you can only do it on the telephone. And for me, putting maybe 20 gigabytes of footage through the telephone to put these gauges on, it just doesn't seem right. So what I've done is I've, um, I'm using a piece of software called telemetry overlay which is absolutely amazing it really does work first time um, if you saw I did put a link on Facebook maybe yesterday or the day before because um, the guys who are the software developers from telemetry overlay actually used some of my footage to explain how to do a few things with it which is nice um, and with this uh, telemetry overlay, for, for the software that I'm using, it cost me, I think it was around 70 US dollars. But after a lot of messing around trying to use free stuff to get the same effect and never really getting a good result, I paid the money for telemetry overlay and then immediately used it and it works perfectly first time. Oh yes, very nice indeed. And the latest addition is being able to put the map on there of where you've gone and that really is very nice. So I would highly recommend it. No, I didn't get it for free. No, I'm not getting any money from them. I'm just using it and I like it. So if I like it, I'm very happy to recommend it to everybody else. So there we go. Um, yeah, so uh, back to the question, yes, there is a GPS in uh, all GoPro cameras since the hit. There we go. All right, so, all right, Sebu says, see you in June 2022. All right, David says, I always see your videos. I'm 14 years old and have a tornado. I would love to come to Vasiliki. Nice. Whereabouts do you keep your tornado, David? Um, that would be quite interesting to know. All right. Anyway, let's... Uh, I've got one more preloaded question, which is from Arthur. And this is in response to the video where the mast of the Hobie 14 came down. And David asks, oh no, sorry, Arthur asks, um, is the Hobie 14 prone to the mast falling down? Does it have 
a weakness? So my quick answer is no, it doesn't have a weakness. But the slightly longer answer is all of this, the stainless steel rigging that most boats use does go after a while. I would say normally if, if you've got a boat near to the sea, salt water, then the salt water in the air, even if you're not um, using the boat very frequently, the rigging will deteriorate. And after, I reckon between three and five years, you'll start having rigging fail because of that high salt content in the air and that combined with UV. So out here in Greece, it's very salty here. and We have a lot of UV. So our rigging perhaps might fail a bit sooner. And the place where it does fail is wherever you've got an eye, you'll have a ferrule and then you'll have the wire there. And what happens, I believe, is the ferrule is, of course, very stiff. This is a, to crimp the wire together to hold it in that shape. And then when that crimp finishes, you've just got the wire, which is a lot less stiff. So on the points where there's flexing, all the, there'll be some hard flexing on that joint, which means that that is going to create a weakness in the wire as that flexing's going backwards and forwards. Eventually, strands are going to go, and then it um, eventually it's going to break. The one that breaks more often than not, uh, more often than anything else, is on the boats which have what is called a pigtail. So uh, it's a term, I believe, that just Hobie use, and that's where you've got a short piece. Um, which then attaches to something else like the jib or, um, yeah, usually the jib. So the short piece is much more likely to break more often than the longer pieces. And that, I believe, would be because the, um, the percentage of the wire is less and the percentage of other stuff is more, which means it's more likely to break. If you've got a furling jib on your boat, then what might happen if the you'll have a fur a, a swivel, sorry, towards the top of the rigging, and if that swivel doesn't rotate freely, um, then instead of it swiveling like that when you furl the jib, it's actually the wire which is going to be twisting, and that will also um, accelerate the chance of it breaking, bad times. But um, no, it's not specific to the Hobie 14, these things with uh, the rigging breaking, mast coming down. So there you go. All right, Piz 7, uh, I think we're back to the tornado sailing. Definitely seemed super tough conditions and very good sailors. We're hoping to have eight tornadoes at the Nationals in Australia, when we're allowed to travel around the country again. Yeah, if um, if you get to the Nationals, say hello to all the guys who know me and uh, get them to say hi. Um, yeah, there's Brett and Jared who sail out of Nedlands Sailing Club. Uh, it's near or around Perth, I believe. Uh, they've, I've raced against those guys many times, nice guys. All right, Anthony, do you think it's a good idea to have a day cruise on a catamaran? And what would you suggest if it is feasible? Yeah, this is a great idea. This is something that the catamaran really works well for, is doing a day cruise or going off somewhere. Um, because with a catamaran, it is very easy, a lot easier than with a monohull to put it on the beach. So what um what we do here 
uh, at Wild Wind is once a week when the weather's not looking too windy is we sail around to the west coast of the island and then we can pull the boats up onto the beach, have a nice bit of time on a beach that you can only get to by boat. And then we sail back and the sail back is usually quite exciting. The sail there is just scenic. So yeah, doing day cruises is absolutely brilliant on a catamaran because also you've got quite